everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. We get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Uh, I'm having some trouble with my video, but my guest, Angry Anderson, I don't think he has a problem with that. How are you doing, Andy? <laughs> I do not, and I and it's no deference to your good self. Um, it's always a it's always a good thing to be able to actually see who you're talking to. Yeah. But I must say yeah. that the uh, the imagery that you've uh, substituted, um, the, the background, interestingly enough, is the House of Parliament um, in, in uh, London, or well, what's left of it. It's, a, right. it's an apocalyptic scene. So oh, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole lot of destruction. But in the foreground, this, this, this wildly physically attractive woman in a, in a corsetia, black, of course, attractive. with black... It's, it's Halloween black. here in North America, angry. So well, I, she, she, she's she's depicting the, the dark because she's got dark, well, black wings. Um, scary. What's more the, scary than a late twenties brunette in a corset? Ooh, scary boys and girls. Yeah, well, I I have to say, uh, I possibly wouldn't be scared, but they would. I would be stimulated. <laughs> well, you know what? She might <laughs> scare the me. pants off you. Well, that'll be a that'll be a delightful start to the situation, which I imagine could take place. Yeah. Although I'd be quite willing to remove them myself on her behalf. But anyway, always having a, said that, always a team player, eh? Angry, always a team player. <laughs> I'm, I just I'm a I'm a person who gives earnest. I just give and give and give. You know, it's like, I know that. I mean. So everybody knows Angry Anderson from Rose Tattoo and um, had the hit single Suddenly. And 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 if you live in Australia or down under, um, you're going to know Angry is not only a musician, but he's a politician. Um, he's been a politician, um, public speaker, a rights advocate. Recently, uh, before I forget, I've been I read the Australian news from time to time, and your name has popped up um, for the reasons of. Uh, is this fair to say, and I've read headlines pretty much, but um, you think that Australians are viewed by other countries maybe as racist? Is, is that what I read? No, no, I don't think so much as, as I, I, I'm, you know, when I say um, uh, I'm, I'm not concerned what other people in other countries perceive us as be, uh, as Australians, because um, it, we suffer from the same sort of misinformation, if you like, about America. Right. Um, if you to believe the mainstream press uh, from your country, which which I don't, uh, when I say your country, Canada, particularly Canada these days, oh, um, I, I, although I have to say, and I don't want it to sound condescending, I, I have great fear and anxiety for uh, the people of Canada. For if if what mainstream and uh, particularly the alternative streams of news are telling us. It's that in bad. It is that um, bad. Well, okay, I'm sad to hear that. But yep. one of the things that um, is now starting to manifest itself in Europe, and I have seen uh, in a in a few instances, like with the blockade, with the with the truck blockade in Canada, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, the the revolt, if you like, or the pushback by the farmers, there is a glimmer of hope. And I think the glimmer of hope is that um, though that Canada or Canadians will vote in an alternative view of government than the one they have. But what I fear the most, not just for Canada, but for here in Australia, getting back to that racist uh, um, I introduction, so to speak, um, is that, that we suffer from and it's a great wisdom, um, and, and it comes from an American. I think I'm not too sure that uh, Noam Chomsky was a. Actually, he's a lefty, and I'm, I'm a conservative by by persuasion. Right. But um, I think it was he that said that um, the, the two the two, the two alternative uh, strong party positions are to give the illusion or the illusion, and, and not so much the illusion, but the illusion that there is choice. Absolutely. And um, a, another great wisdom that came from that, that era of great thinking that ran about the 60s into the 70s was uh, that um, 
the, the illusion was going to get stronger and uh, as the two sides were seen more and more and more every day to be complicit in the same, uh, in, in, to, to achieve the same ends. So getting back to the racist thing, um, you're referring to the referendum of recent days in Australia, um, which was to uh, change our constitution to include the recognition of the Australian Aboriginal people. Right. And about 90%, last time the question was asked uh, in a different form many years ago, they were recognised because about 99.9% .9 of all Australians, like Americans, like Canadians, like English people, um, aren't inherently, as they would paint us to be, racist. Um, like I was about to say, um, uh, you know, and I don't know which way, well, I... I've got a feeling now which way your your vote goes, but up until recent times, um, the world has been led to believe by your prime minister that Canadians predominantly are racist, um, homophobic, Islamophobic, you know, all the all the phobics, mm -hmm. um, and and that's the picture that he and his party or his persuasion, political persuasion paints for the rest of the world of Canadians. And I think most people in the world, particularly in Australia, I mean, compared to America, and I don't mean to be judgmental, certainly not moralistic, but um, I certainly don't mean to be judgmental of the American people, but um, they seem to be uh, less informed than most people um, in, in the Western world about the politics and, and the, the social structures of the rest of the world. Um, I think I, Americans I've been are, told uh, that by Americans. Um, I live right on the border with the uh, United States, so I, I do have interaction with a lot of Americans. Actually, most of my subscribers are American, but I have been told that by them because, and the way that the intellects will say is that their media is so overwhelming, they don't really have a choice in certain ways to be informed about other countries. A lot of Americans don't even know they think that as soon as you cross the Canadian border, you, you can ski. I mean, we have 80, 90 degree uh, Fahrenheit uh, summers as well, but they, they literally think that as soon as you go up north, you can start skiing any time of year. Well, yeah, I, I remember there was a one of those podcasting things and um, uh, this young, bright young thing at, at uh, on one of the, you know, campuses, and she uh, said that she was um, she would never go to ca uh, to Canada because she was af afraid of polar bears. Um, having said that, it just it gives you an example. Uh, only one. I don't think that's probably a highly uh, or a, a largely held view. But the fact that she thought that the, the problem with bears in Canada was to do with polar bears, um, not grizzly bears. <laughs> <laughs> um, or beavers. It's, it, it sort of intonated that, um, uh, you know, they, they have a very limited view of even their proximity. Right. Um, a lot of Americans, particularly because of the immigration debate now, the open border thing that Biden allowed to happen, um, uh, it, all of a sudden there's a focus on these people from South America. <laughs> Right. And one of the interesting aspects of that is a lot of them are African coming through South America, but that's another story. Mm -hmm. um, that's a more complex uh, issue because it's it's part of the of the um, the complexity of the design and the operation to destroy Western society as it is. So right. the fact that African people are coming from from uh, you know other places to enter America is because that's where it's easier to, to enter. But the the focus, anyway, they were asking people because predominantly, historically, the people coming across the border have been from the South American continent. Mexico. And, and it's it seemed to me by these podcasts of people going into campuses and, and interviewing people that, that most American youth have no idea how big South America is and, and and how it's made up of different countries like um for instance africa they asked an african-american a person of brown color person of color um 
you know, about Africa. And they said, you know, like, what's what's the capital of Africa? And she said, Egypt. And um, they asked about, you know, and she was not aware that Africa is a continent made up of, you know, uh, a bunch of countries right. all, all presided over by their own government, president, whatever, and um, that they all have different... Um, um, different parliaments or different government right. systems. And, um, uh, yeah, so it was it's surprising that, 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 that young Americans that are at university getting degrees In um, have, <laughs> have, have little, well, they have, they have little, little or no knowledge of the rest of the world still to this day. And, you know, I mean, this infernal, you know, device, right has opened up I, I think at one stage it's 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 um, only a, a, a percent or two or three of all the knowledge in the world is accessible through your phone right so you know these people live in 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 blissful ignorance so to speak that only in this sense, it's, 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 it works against them. So it's not blissful at all. But, they're f but they are free. I mean, okay, like if you look at both sides of the coin, they are free from the anxieties that the rest of the world, um, let's say, suffers from because they're not aware of them. I mean, you know, um, you know I, I have a friend who's Ukrainian and so... He sees the war. He's um, he's married to a, a, a Russian woman, mm -hmm. and they, they came to Australia many, many, many years ago and started a business. So they're very successful, etc. And um, he still he still has um, you know like several generations of family in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, predominantly in the Russian speaking sectors. So. Um, he's got some friends um, that have, yeah, they, they've got children and they've got children and um, there's several generations and, and the younger generation, of course, are, are very pro-NATO, whereas the older generation uh, brought up under um, the Soviet Union uh, education system uh, are very pro-Russia, very pro-Putin. So, you know, you get this, um, uh, what, what it illustrates, but these kids, these kids are very savvy when it comes to the rest of the world, when it comes to knowing about, like they know the, the complexity of the, of the um, as much as we are aware of, of how um, uh, Arabic policy affects them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it affects them economically and, uh, you know, like, through oil, through gas, through, uh, you know, through trade, whatever. Whereas Americans are blissfully unaware, ignorant, if you like, but unaware of, of any of that complexity of modern day life. They are just oblivious to it. And I have friends, you know, that, um, well, you know, the guys that play in Guns N' Roses. I have friends that, you know, I, that we made, that I've stayed in contact with, um, when we first toured in there in the, in the early 80s, um, uh, you know, ex, ex road crew, um, road manager, um, you know, people who worked with the Indy Record Company and, right. you know, people that I've, uh, friends, they've become friends. I mean, even though we don't see one another from one, one decade to another, we're still firm. We're still, you know, we're staunch. We're, we're, we're best mates. We, we bonded over. Yeah, around music so it's a it's a very strong bond and, and they they keep me informed as much as they can but like i said you know the, the there's no excuse for anybody not knowing what's going on because right. there's the mainstream news which you can get on on your phone or your that, that device it's not just a phone mm -hmm. but um but there's also the alternative views there's the, that's where i go yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I alternate between the two. I, I don't spend as much time with the mainstream press as, as some people do because they don't deserve that kind of um, acknowledgement because they are so, it's all profit, so really. fucked up. 
they're so fucked up. I mean, it's yeah. just what they they basically, you know, and they've been proven time and time again to just fucking lie. They just lie. They'll say whatever comes out of the White House or the parliaments in Canada without doing any mm. real journalism anymore. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, yeah, every now and again on Facebook, um, they throw on the side of that or Google shit. The only two that I really follow uh, um, prolifically are uh, Facebook and um, and and the Google thing. Um, mm. uh, what is it called? YouTube. Um, right. Um, I've got Messenger and I've got a few other things, but you know, I don't. Um, yeah, and I I, I look at um, the, there's this fantastic montage that they put up every now and again of. of They'll take 20 news readers from different news shows on different channels. And then they have them all speaking at once. So they're all reading from exactly, they're saying exactly the same oh, thing. I, I saw reading. that, especially during uh, COVID. All the yeah. prime ministers, all the presidents, all the leaders of every world said the same yep. line verbatim. Yeah. 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 So somebody, it's like, um, Getting back to the uh, uh, the racist thing, I uh, the, the the pieces that I wrote because you know, I was very much uh, against um, against the the referendum because you once you change the constitution, um, our legal system has said that it's if it's not impossible, it's very close to impossible to reverse that once it's institutionalized in the constitution. It's there, right? It becomes right. part of the constitution. So the recognition of Aboriginal peoples has never been in doubt with the Australian people. Yeah. But the 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 propagandists, the uh, the activists, the people who would, and this is happening right around the world. It's happening in your in your home as well. Um, is that there is an insidious um, effort at work, an evil evil. Um, effort at work to divide us and particularly um and it's written in the, the new world charter so it's, it's written there as a document oh yeah it's, you're trying to rewrite yeah. history for the uh, yeah. agenda 2030 yeah yeah well apart from rewriting history that's a way of devaluing the history that exists right but the most evil thing is that they are they are trying to create a new history based on their view of yeah. how the world has to be. And that's like, you know, I mean, when you turn around and say to people, um, well, they're going to halve the population. Ah, they'll never get away with that. Really? Yeah, look what's happening now. All the, all the uh, adverse reactions to, you know, taking a poison without, you know, a lot of countries, it was um, your course. A poison? That's yeah. really inflammatory. Well, I, I am trying to be careful because uh, YouTube likes to censor people. So, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. You agree? No, it's definitely poison. Definitely poison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before we get any further, what I wanted to do, um, mm. I, I asked some of the readers to come up with some questions for you. <laughs> yeah. This could be good. <laughs> yeah, I got a few. But um, before I do that, right. I'll read you a couple things that um, – I got comments on, on our first interview a couple of years ago. Somebody wrote, mm -hmm. he is a legend. I love Angry. His music has got me through some tough times. Rose Tattoo forever. Um, angry, seeing you perform on Saturday at Southport Sharks was for me the highlight of my life. Thank you. Um, love Rose Tattoo. My favorite song is Southern Stars. Um, I think you're a wonderful man and a great Australian. I love Angry. Um, so that's that. So what do you think when you hear those uh, nice comments from people? <clears throat> well, one of, the, one of the things that comes about um, with age, apart from things breaking down, oh my goodness. is, um, you know, I mean, physical things like health. I've, in recent days, I won't bore you with it, but I've, I've had to deal with a, a, a three major medical issues that sort of came together at the same time over a six month period. And um, yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit of a, there was quite a few months of, of, of genuine concern, um, but I'm good now. I've, good I've dealt with them. Um, we've had treatment, surgery, whatever. 
and um, uh, now it's just getting back. It's healing now and getting okay. back, um, uh, you know, like uh, um, a good level of, of, of physical and mental health. But the, the thing about when you read out things like that to me, once upon a time, I'd be really, I would, I was very uncomfortable with that. And the reason that we're so uncomfortable when we're younger, the main reason, is because um, we're uncomfortable with uh, raw emotion. Right. And um, now I embrace it because I've learned uh, the error, if you like, or that that to be uncomfortable with raw emotion is 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 to deny yourself those feelings. So when I hear <clears throat> when I hear things like that, as you just read out, I am moved um, uh, very deeply because I know. Well, I I imagine that people don't write things like that if it doesn't come from a from a, a, a deep um, part, a real part within them. And, you know, I have, um, this is not uh, blowing my own trumpet, but, um, you know, not a week goes by, which is wonderful experience for someone like me. Not a week goes by where I don't hug someone who's a complete stranger. And and they just want, want that personal contact because they you know, they I'm, you know, particularly here in Australia, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, I suppose, um, you know, like a household name. I mean, mm -hmm. only, only the very, very young don't know who I am, but um, um, which is wonderful because it means that it's the, it's the gradual passing of of uh, of time, and right. it's it's a it's a great indicator that 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 you are you know, in, in your last days, not just physically, but your time. And we, we are only ever allotted a certain amount of time in our history, mm. uh, if you like, in the history of our life. Like, so, you know, four score and 10, whatever you wanted to call it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have, um, I have the occasion, um, um, it, it's like when I used to do public speaking, you know, and I'd go and, I'd go and speak in um, in jails and um, uh, young offenders or older older offenders would would say to me that you know the, the rose tattoo music because it was written uh, by males about males. It's a male band. It's a, it, you know I write songs from a male point of view and and for my own personal life experiences which has been about like most of us has been about pain coping growth um you know dealing with the hardships that life quite necessarily has to be mm -hmm. and um yeah so when, you know, when you hear things like that you think like it, it constantly reminds us that our lives are worthwhile and and that, uh, that we all really do matter and and it, it, the way that we choose to to live each day affects somebody somewhere. So it's a it's an awesome responsibility. I mean, awesome in both the modern day um, appreciation of awesome. That's great, you know. Well, mm -hmm. awesome doesn't mean great. It means you know gargantuan. It means like awesome is is um you know like um. I was watching this thing the other day because there was a mate of mine who lives in, in Florida and a guitar player, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and um, he used to uh, have, have a band called Axe. And um, uh, we were talking about uh, the tornadoes and this, et cetera. So that's an awesome right. occurrence. And there was, there was footage, you know, that reminded me to ring him and, and just check up on him, see how he's going. But, um, you know, earthquakes are, are, are fantastic, awesome. It doesn't mean they're good. Yeah. It just means that it's a proportional thing, right? So, and but yeah, three, I, I... It's got three more letters than great. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Not too See? bad. So... <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> so... Yeah, I, 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 am, I am absolutely... It's probably those sort of things that people say to you personally or write to you about you. Mm -hmm. 
I would have to say, and, and this is a very romantic view, they're, they're the sort of things that have got, always got me through. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, one of the questions here was basically it was a, it was like, they said, your life hasn't been easy, angry. What gives you the strength to keep going strong? And and you alluded to it. It's It's got to do with, as you get older, you appreciate your your place on this earth and what you mean to other people. Yeah. Yeah. That sort of thing. I, um, you know, because um, in a couple of days, it's the anniversary uh, of when we lost Liam. And so my children will come here to the family home and, um, and we will spend the weekend uh, together. Um, they'll move in, uh, which is lovely for the weekend. And, um, and yeah, we'll eat together and we'll drink together and we'll, and we'll just be together. We, you know, I mean, quite necessarily the conversation will, you know, there'll be photos brought out and there'll be, you know, personal ad anecdotal stories. And remember this party, you know, remember this right. night we were out, you know, and yeah, and it's, it's a way of, uh, of, of, um, uh, keeping him obviously alive in right. a sense, but, um, but always, always present, yeah. um, which is why, you know, there's certain things around the, ha the home, um, oh, like there's certain, um, things he had in his room, um, uh, on the wall, like pictures, he, he, he bought this collection of, um, uh, three prints of this famous uh, English artist um, who painted these incredibly intricate, um, beautiful uh, depictions of like um, village life, you know, sort of uh, pictures, painted pictures, hand painted pictures, uh, watercolors of, um, of of cottages and churches and stuff like that. Was it kind of like so, medieval? No, no, it's more, it's more sort of like um, early this century, sort of, um, but village life and, and depicted in, in, in this beautifully um, ornate sense, like so this incredible detail. But anyway, I, I took them out of, out of his room because I wanted to, um, last year, I wanted to, to, to turn the room into something more than just, Liam's room. I mean, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, took everything out, took everything off the walls and, uh, repainted it. Mm -hmm. And now it's, now it's a guest room. Okay. And, um, so probably for the kids, so, uh, they come over and my, my daughter and her, her man would sleep in there or my eldest son. Um, mm -hmm. and he's, he's, uh, girl they, they were sleeping there but um but they there are uh, i took to some of the things his favorite things and put them around the house hung them on the walls um so yeah i mean he's you know he, no matter where any of us are that, and that's that's the thing about family is that right. you know it, it, there's the, there's the physical life that we have and, mm -hmm. and that's a wonderful celebration in itself and then there's, of course, the connection we have with the divine, and right. that is that's the forever part, you know. It is, so um, yeah, so as long as those uh, as long as those memories are alive, so as the person, so to speak. So yeah, but yeah, getting back to um, the strengths of, I, I think it's one of the things, and I, okay. I, it, when I get into this area, mm -hmm. there's certain people go, whoa, you know, here he goes again, get your chin for your hat out sort of thing. Um, but there are, I have noticed, uh, getting back to, you know, the, the, the thread of architecture, how it manifested the, the spiritual being. Right. Um, um, art in all its forms was so much more beautiful then. Right. So yeah. uh, the comparison that was given by this person was said, well, have a look at modern art. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, you look at it and you can't make any sense out of it, but it's a person's feelings. Right. Right. So they, they, they create this in, in instead of a, um, like the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. for instance. Right. So there's this wonderful photo on, on, um, on face fart, um, of, of him and her. Oh, really? 
like she's sitting with him in the studio. Hmm. And it's an old photo that they just only discovered some years ago and were able to bring it back through uh, imaging uh, rehancing or in enhancing. Yeah. They were able to bring it back to its... But, you know, because for years and years and years, we wonder, well, who, who's Mona Lisa? You know, the, the common thought was, oh, so it's a compilation of three different women in his life. Well, it turns out, and when you see this photo of him sitting with her, like side by side. Right. And it's the woman in the painting. I mean, she just looks exactly like, so it was a real person. Yeah. No, I've definitely it, read, read a lot about that too. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think we uh, think along the same lines, whereas a few years ago, people would say when I would suggest something, let's say digital IDs are coming. Well, oh, put your tinfoil hat on, Ernest. And I'm like, okay, so now where are we? <laughs> and everywhere you look, it's all on the agenda in parliaments to pass this. And then it's going to be under the skin in a microchip form. They're already doing it in Sweden. Like voluntarily, some businesses have opted for a microchip and their, their employees are saying this is the greatest thing because... Instead of having money, I just swipe my hand in the cap, the canteen or cafeteria at lunch, and it deducts my lunch off my paycheck. Yeah. The key but, phrase but, there, Ernest, as you and I both appreciate, is I have no money. No, you fucking don't. No. We, we, they we, have it. You will own nothing, and you will be happy. money. They have your money. Yeah. This is what people don't get. This is why people, like I said before a while ago, about the, 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 the truth is there for all to see. They tell you what they're doing. That, That's right. That war, that war criminal Schwab has and said. Gates. Yeah. Yeah, and Gates. Oh, what an evil, evil man. The thing is, they I mean, think that it's all this, this uh, digital mon money is all great and all, but... You, you piss off the wrong government, as you saw in Canada, they can turn off and freeze your accounts. So only or, set, or set your country on fire. Right. Look at Hawaii. That was kind of interesting, wasn't it? I was just, I was a bit, a, a little bit before, I was going to mention experiments that they carry out. Yeah, do direct energy weapons. And, 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 and they do it in a they do it in a in a, in a controlled confined environment so to, so they can actually analyze the results, right? And they got away with it. And as soon as it and happened they, in Lahaina, I, the government went in and bought all that land. Like that doesn't make any sense. And you couldn't have reporters in there from the alternative media. It was fenced off. But people don't see that on CNN or Fox or CBC here in Canada. That's what I don't get. You know, like, I think it's about 80% of the population and, and or 70% of the population own a smartphone. I think it might even be higher than that now. And, and you know, because, we're you know, we're, we're sort of like excluding people, uh, you know, Eskimos, uh, people that live in the, the deep jungles of South America, the, the, right. the tribesmen in, uh, you know, I don't know, Afghanistan. Um but, but, you know, there are a certain amount of people that just don't have the inclination to own one for a start. And yet, um, you notice that um, one of the things that I was, I was watching this thing on, um, it completely, you know, off the track here, I was watching this um, this guy, N Nigel Farage from, from, from England. Right. He's a politician? And he said... Uh, he, he's, uh, he's been involved in politics because he... he um, he was a speaker at the UN for years, okay. but, um, but he's more a social commenter now, okay. commenter, co commentator. Okay. And he said, do you notice something about all the males that are flooding Britain and Europe? They're all incredibly well-dressed. They've got, uh, you know, like top-of-the-line uh, clothes. Mm -hmm. Sports shoes that cost like three to four hundred dollars a pair, you know. Uh, most of them, are, you know, wearing track suits that cost, you know, anywhere between two and three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And the blah blah blah, right? And they all arrive with the latest, in most cases, with the latest edition smartphone. Oh yeah, well they're giving them said, away. A lot of them, they give them, a, they give them away because yeah. once somebody has the newest phone or whatever demographic you live in. 
everybody is getting to the point where it's going to be like as soon as you're born you you're gonna you're gonna be um, smartphone applicable like i mean actually just i just read kenya is trying to pass a law in parliament where as soon as you're born you get a digital idea kenya i just read that yeah. today yeah well the other thing too is that you know they've got several types of surveillance now they've got optic identification oh yeah um, and they've got facial, which is you know, from a distance. Um, they've got optical. If you if you're going to walk through a door, like to go to a supermarket or whatever, right. and they're getting back to your money. They've got your money, right? When they get rid of cash. Yeah. If you approach a supermarket, as you walk through the door, it reads your iris or your facial recognition. Mm -hmm. And then a voice says, uh, dear citizen, my words, right? Just mimicking um, mm -hmm. Orwell. Um, dear citizen, your credit for today is 78 units. In other words, that's what you can spend. Your social credit score. For today. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I'm glad you brought up and one Go ahead. And your and 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 thirty percent of that is the tax you've got to pay for your carbon footprint. So now you're down to forty five uh, to spend. Bingo. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm glad you brought get, up that because I'm actually <laughs> reading the George Orwell. Well, I'm actually listening to the audiobook 1984. Um, I've mm -hmm. read it before really quickly, but I might have a guest on that wrote a book called uh, Becoming George Orwell, and it's his name is John Rodden. If I can get him on. But it's so interesting on how everything in that book that was written in 1949 or 48 or whatever is so identical to what's happening now. Except for this. Except for that. He didn't envisage that. Yeah. He, he had he had he had the the um the UAPD. educator was yeah. a TV, Big Brother yep. TV. Um two way. He envisaged yep. that. Um, so he, he just got the size and the shape and, and, and the, uh, the technology, but, you know, he wasn't to know, you know, uh, how quickly, um, you know, it, it, getting back to, um, artificial intelligence, I mean, a few people that have said that are no longer with us, um, and, uh, but it ha only have passed in recent times. I'm not suggesting that's why they did, because it's common knowledge, but, right. A couple of them that it were, were, were clear thinkers, Robin Williams and other people like that, had said um, uh, artificial intelligence will be the end of, 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 of our real freedom. Yeah. I remember reading an article on Facefart, um, and this was, this was like a year ago. Um, It was about an experiment they're having, they're, they're conducting already in Japan, where they've got males living with female robots to 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 study, the, uh, you know, the, how they adapt to living with someone that doesn't react right. in a human sense, right? Um, and uh, the, the reporter said, "Well, how come there's no how come there's no experiments with?" women's you know and they said well we're working on that but it's it's it, it, they didn't explain why but they said it's more complex to create a male robot hmm. than it is the female and i suspect it isn't i suspect that they created the female first because of the sexual attraction thing it's a lot easier to get men to accept a, a walking talking doll that never says no to anything. Right. You know, anyway, that's just my theory. But no, they, I, yeah, they've actually, they've actually got a, a social experiment where they've, they've had, and they interviewed some of these men and they said, well, what, you know, what, how old were you when you first started, you know, living with, with Zazu or whatever her name was. And he said, oh, well, you know, it's been three years now and I was 21 and I was at, you know, university and, and they said, well, how's it going? Oh, yeah, no, it's fantastic. You know, it's, um, you know, it's really, really good. You know, come home at night, you know, she massages me. Um, you know, we have sex every day. You know, she cooks me wonderful food. You know what I mean? But it's a fucking robot. Yeah, I think it's, um, 
it probably has to do with a bit of the transhumanism aspect of Absolutely. where they want to go. It's, yeah, it's, it's because they don't want us to have human, human. relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Because human relationships produce, as you said before, when you asked me about how did I feel about those, I, I was touched. I'd love to meet those people. I know I shouldn't. I, mean, I shouldn't. I know I shan't. I won't ever, well, unless a miracle happens, which is, miracles can happen, but mm. I probably would never make, meet those people that have written those things. But those, all of a sudden, there's an emotional response, an attachment between me and them. Yeah, I saw that. Because, because um, they've reached out to me, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I'm, I am not beyond believing that they felt that. Even though they wrote to you about me, I think somewhere deep inside all of us, there's this wonderful acknowledgement of our connection with the divine and our and, and so to say that we are connected to the divine means we are con connected to one another well they um i remember listening to an art bell show years ago he was a famous american talk show host who talked about ufos and conspiracy theorists but also a lot of things that are real intellectual um in sciences and i remember him talking with uh, i think my Michio Kaku, he's a famous physicist, about atoms. If they can split an atom and they have one atom in a scientific laboratory in, say, Davos or in Switzerland, and they have one in, say, Berkeley in L.A. or Massachusetts, if they manipulate that one atom, its sister atom on the other side of the world would move. It's just, that's extraordinary. And yeah. Even even a lot of people, and I'm not being, this, this is not being critical or condescending, um, but a lot of people are going to hear that, Ernest, and, and, and they'll go, that's amazing. That's amazing. And then that's the end of their connection to the thought, to the, to the idea. Um, it's extraordinary. Yeah. It's extraordinary because what it says, like when I refer to this, because I'm sitting in my office and I'm looking into it, my backyard, which is like a jungle. I live in, I live in the middle of suburbia, but I live on a very steep block, and it's, um, it's a, an area where there's a, what they call um, uh, corridors, and it's for animals to move around. Right. right. So it, at the bottom, at the, our backyards in in this whole street is a, a corridor. You're not allowed to build retaining or restrictive fences. You have to build fences that if you do in you know, at all build fences and I don't see the point but so I look out there and all I see is like green like trees ferns um there's like four species of trees you know there's native birds and um uh, you know you don't see any civilization is what I'm saying so okay I constantly you know when I'm I say well the divine because I'm looking at the, you know, part of the physical manifestation, but you know, but what I'm talking about, what what you mentioned, it was it was the, it was the connected the connection that we had, the connectedness that we all enjoy, and and that you know, there's a, a wonderful study about this, uh, like you said. Um, I read this years and years and years ago when they were talking about uh, particle acceleration, right. Um, because once they said, well, we've discovered the atom, this is years and years ago. So what makes up an atom? An atom. And so then they looked at, well, what is the makeup? What, what, what are the building blocks to make an atom? So as, as infinite as we are to believe that the universe is, and there's no other way for us to comprehend, mm -hmm. Um, unless, of course, you know, we say like, like the flat earth and they say, well, there's, well, that's a dimensional theory from what I can gather. So there's no, we don't live in a dome like some people you know, are adamant that we do because it's, because that means there's a, a limit to it. You know, there's a, right. an extremity that you reach. Well, I can't comprehend that. So I don't accept it, but, yeah. um, 
Yeah, so uh, the connectiveness, getting back to that, that's an extraordinary thing that says so much more than just, well, if you've got an atom here and you've got an atom in a different state, let alone a different country. Right. If you stimulate, stimulate that atom to do something or react to something, it's then mirrored you know in its as you said it's twin it's sister it's brother whatever right that 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 says all that we need to understand about our place within the divine inspiration within the universe yeah Which, we, and, and and what it says is that we're all connected everything is connected 100 percent um yeah. I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions here. Mm. Um, quick! <laughs> no, not quick. They're, they're never quick with Angry Anderson. This is great. This is, this is why we had to have part, have part two, because the first time I interviewed you was like a great 90 minutes, and people said we want more. Um, I've got one. Oh, wow. Jesus, that must be. Uh, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. That's beautiful. Has there ever been any contact or discussion at all between you and the ACDC camp at all? I'm his friends. There's never been I'm any a, suggestion that you would fill in no, if Ryan was sick no, or anything like that? No, no, no. That's hard to believe. Well, it, it sort of isn't, it isn't. It's, it's kind of like, you see, back in the day, um, um, I mean, the chain of events, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> The chain of events started previous to that when Phil left uh, Buster, which is a band that he and I were in, Buster Brown. This is pre-ACDC, pre-Rose Tattoo. Um, he, he left to join ACDC because Buster Brown was falling apart. Mm -hmm. and, and then Mark Evans joined the band as a bass player. <laughs> so, uh, you know, through Phil, I had... I had, therefore, um, a, a small group of friends, particularly the other members of Buster Brown. Um, Geordie Leach was the bass player who went on to play bass with the Tats. Um, so there was a, a, a mutual friendship thing that, that developed. So years later, when um, ACDC were, were, you know, on their way, and Rose Tats uh, were... Well, we, we got to a point where every major record company in Australia came and saw us because they used to go, you know, there were so many hot bands around in those days. Mm -hmm. Every every record company, company sent their representatives to look at the band and possibly sign them up. Right. And we, we, we just couldn't get signed because they didn't understand or they didn't, they weren't prepared to, to deal with how extravagant the band was, like, you know, how over the top, so to speak, use their vernacular. But um, the, the guys from ACDC were, you know, huge fans. And so they brought us to uh, the attention. I might add at this stage that Bon and, and um, well, Bon Malcolm and uh, Angus, particularly um, Angus, um, probably next Bon, but they... They've been uh, three or four uh, of the only three or four people from our other bands that were that ever ever got up and jammed with with Rose Tats. That, that they could turn up at our gigs and what I you know particularly Angus loved to get up and you know play all the old Chuck Berry stuff and stuff you know so so it was a very very uh, warm affectionate relationship and they they introduced introduced us to what became known as the Alberts family. <clears throat> okay. And it's kind of like, you know, unless you're a bent wall person, you don't, you know, it's kind of like you, you keep things in the family, but you don't fuck with the family. If you yeah, know what for I mean. sure. So, um, I think one of the things that like in, in, I remember when, when Bond first uh, passed, um, you know, there was a whole lot of, uh, there was obviously three or four uh, singers here in Australia that put their hand up. Um, and um, 
It was obvious to those of us in the inner circle that they were very unlikely to pick someone that was known. Okay. That was in another band. Okay. And certainly not one of the family. Okay. If you know what I'm saying. They wanted to maybe bring someone in that they could kind of mold. Is that fair to say? I, I, I think so. I think that's very fair to say, Ernest. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things about Brian is, and it's wonderful, that, that is that he was picked for his uh, vocal abilities, first and foremost, but smart enough to realise that joining, coming in from the outside to not fill the shoes of, but to replace like to be the singer in ACDC, he was smart enough, which is why I have so much respect for him. He was smart enough to realise that not only did he just have to vocally carry the songs, but he, he, he knew that the band was would never be the same. They weren't going to try and, re, and, and, and get someone to be the new Bond. They wanted someone to be the new singer, the new front man. Because what was obviously emerging in those days, even when Bond was in the band, was that the show, what people went to see was Angus. Right. Cool. And and cool. Angus was Angus was the visual part. He was, you know, visually he was stronger than than Bond. And um but Bond was a great front man. Mm -hmm. But so is Brian. Right. And, um, but it's, it's not like, I don't know. I, you know, I think but the way, the way I've looked at it and I've known them since the very, very beginning, you know, when they used to wear platform boots and satin trousers, you know, which was, <laughs> <laughs> they've all admitted was a, not their finest moment, but, um, yeah, it was always, you know, Angus was, I mean, you have a look at him on stage, you know, have a listen to him. Mm -hmm. He's a consummate rock and roll guitar player. There's, there might be some as good, but there's none better. And as a showman, I mean, it's, it's Angus, you know, like he's everywhere. He's doing the duck walk. He's swiveling around on the, you know, he's doing his, um, his curly spins you know yeah. on the on, yeah. on the floor and all those things that, 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 that the band are legendary for it's all about him so you know it's um it's he it, it, it was a very a very wise and i remember saying to malcolm years ago god rest his soul and i said to angus too the last time i saw him um which was only a few years ago at a Guns N' Roses show here in Australia. And I, you know, they always want me to get up and do nice boys. And, and mm -hmm. Angus had, Angus had just finished a run with Axel as singing uh, for ACDC, which again was a, another natural choice as far as I was concerned, because he's, apart from the fact that he's a great front man, he's not going to rival Angus. Um, nobody can. Right. Um, but um, he's got he that scratch carry, voice. He, he could carry the, the, the range, you know, right. he, he, he could do the justice, uh, you know, by seeing, seeing in a, in a pro, the appropriate key. But, um, yeah, I remember saying, I said, you know, did you, was there ever any other singers? And he said, oh, well, you know, not really. You know, we sort of like, we'd met and, and we'd seen Brian and um, they were, you know, because it was Malcolm, predominantly ran the band. Um, I mean, the two of them, you know, like mm. joined at the hip. But, um, yeah, they, they loved his his vocal abilities, basically. And then they loved his persona. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had that cocky sort of uh, pommy kid from the skids, you know, from the wrong side of track sort of vibe going on. Um, like Noddy Holder and, you know, like sort of rough and ready sort of... Um, so that, he had that, that, that charisma going on. But um, anyway, yeah, I remember saying to, to, to both of them at different times, I said, well, there's a couple of other... When it happened, I thought, gee, this is going to be hard. 
-hmm. If they're going to continue, it's going to be hard. And um, one of the singers that I thought was impressed me always as a, a great vocalist that would fit the bill, but wouldn't get in Angus's way and, and just be able to carry the songs was Sammy Hagar. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, Sammy. I think Sammy, though, if you look at him in the last so many years, I think his personality might eventually have been too big. Like, he's he's a very strong personality himself, so I don't know. But actually, you make a good point, because when he was with Van Halen, he didn't step on any toes. He kind of fit right in, so you, you might be right. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, as, as, as strong a front man as, as Sammy became... And um, again, you know, it's it's it, smart people have successful bands. I mean, they, you know, they they realised his strengths. I mean, apart from the fact that he's a good-looking dude, had extraordinary vocal, uh, you know, capabilities. So it, he was given. He wasn't, you know, the the uh, gymnastic showman that um, that David Lee was. But um, then again, you know, he wasn't a great singer. Whereas Sammy is a great vocalist. He's a great great rock singer, you know, in the true sense of the word. But he also looks good and, um, and had a, 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 you know, a, a pretty good um, uh, persona or character or personality mm -hmm. on stage. Where, but, um, you know, when you're in a band with someone that uh, is extraordinary as, um, as any... Um, you're not ever going to overshadow. It's like, you know, I think one of the reasons that, um, well, apart from the fact that uh, Jeff Beckett's his show, mm -hmm. but, you know, if, if you go and sing with Jeff Beck, you're not going to overshadow him, him yeah, his yeah, play. Sure. Um, you're just not going to, because his, his talent is extraordinary, as well as uh, Van Halen. I mean, they, 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 they became known more for the guitar prowess than, than they did uh, for, I mean, out front in a live show, of course, it was all David Lee, you know, right. the, yeah. the shrieks and the mane of hair and the whole LA the high rock scene. But, but, but yeah, but what, what, what they became known for was um, the guitar play. Guitar solo the people with triplets. It, it, yeah, they went along to, yeah, I mean, a great band, too. Fucking mm -hmm. great band, you know. Well, Michael Anthony's often overshadowed, but he was a really good backup singer with the harmonies. Yeah. yeah. And Alex, a great drummer, and so... That Do you know what, I, what I, yeah, the extra, the great, great band, great band. One of the things that... Um, someone said to me just a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, they said, oh, you know, Kiss... They must have used tapes. And I went, really, why? And he said, oh, well, you know, because this, this is a muso. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, the BVs were fantastic. Now, I was told by someone in the crew many years ago, because, you know, I love Kiss, you know. It's the, um, you know, they they understood uh, what, what anthem rock and roll was all about. And they perfected it, you know, in the sense of, you know, inventing the characters, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But he said, no, he said, they, they, this person, the Australian road crew bloke uh, who worked with them when they were ever out here, he said, they sang all their vocals live. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's a lot of controversy these days with um, Mick Mars insinuating or actually saying that um, they did, they had backing tracks on their last tour that Mick Mars was with Monty Crew. Um, so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of controversy with that. Yeah, I I heard about that. Well, we say heard about it. I read it on Facebook or the Google Tube or something. But yeah, I I just thought like there's a bit of animosity though. There, well, he, he's there. suing them. It's it's I don't know if it's before the courts yet, but he they he presented his lawyers presented the Motley Crue brand with papers. I don't know, say two months ago. Um, because when he was basically asked or pushed or removed out of the band, his royalties went, let's say, from 15% to 5% and that sort of thing. So he was so pissed off that he said, OK, I'm going to basically write a tell-all book. And so the press got hold of something in there that 
Um, he was saying the last tour that um, I don't know if it was Nikki or or even Vince, but a lot of them had backing tracks, and he was the only one to actually play an instrument. Wow, <laughs> yeah, that's a big claim. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, mean, you know, you, you sort of can you can come to the party when it comes to vocals because one of the things that and I've noticed it. Um, when you mentioned um, the song Southern Stars, mm -hmm. um, our latest tour before I, well, I had to cut it in half. Uh, we couldn't do the second half of the year because of my medical problems, but um, we're going to, you know, we, we, we get back uh, Australia Day basically. But but um, uh, the tour was called uh, Under the Southern uh, Under the Southern Stars, well, the Southern Stars tour, Under the Southern Stars. And because um, I wanted to make, uh, not blatantly, not, not sort of ram it down people's throats, but um, I wanted to to make a, a sort of a, a social or a political statement that, that, that was based on um, a, a cultural identity of being Australian. And again, mentioning the, the racist thing, I mean, one of the things that came about in the in the, in the year lead up to the referendum was that um, and the act of the activists have been basically bullying the, the Australian public for years about being you know um, uh, racist and about being, right. about, being, about being anti Aboriginal and about being this and about that no, nothing could be further than the truth you know mm -hmm. the the, the, uh, the normal Australian is, is very supportive of our Aboriginal people. I mean, it's the bureaucracy and, in my opinion, those very activists that, that continually try to convince and have got our children convinced that they're racist by, by the fact that they are European by heritage, by you know, birth, um, European or, or, or English. Um, yeah, so they've convinced a, gener a few generations of people that, you know, that we are or they are. And they're the problem, not the bureaucracy and not the people that are in charge of the money that don't spend it wisely on Aboriginal issues. Right. But that's, you know, that's just that point. I just wanted to make that. Mm -hmm. as well. yeah. But, yeah, the... Um, Yeah, it's, it's 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 very interesting. I think the the way things are interwoven. I mean, just that that's why I sort of diverged back back to that. Sorry, I got off the track there. That's okay. That's okay. The the viewer doesn't mind. We like hearing you speak. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I you know. Um, so we, before I diverted, where was I? Um, oh, we were talking about uh, basically. I was just mentioning that um, Mick Mars. Mm, yeah. He was the only one in yeah. the band actually playing an instrument, but mm. but well, I, I think yeah, I think I'm, I'm not too sure about the thread there, but I think uh, one of the things that um, one of the things that I noticed is is um, well, what I was going to allude to mm. is the passing of time, yeah, and how like getting back to the Southern Stars link, which led us off the well, led me <laughs> off the track. It all makes um, sense. Um, there's a song on Southern Stars uh, called Let Us Live. Yeah. And it's uh, Let us live where we want to live. Let us go where we want to go. And it's, it's, it's uh, in those days, I was able to sing comfortably in that register and those in those keys. Mm -hmm. And we found in rehearsal that even when we dropped the guitars uh, half a tone, um, to still try and retain the musical integrity that it was still very difficult for me to hit those notes. So mm -hmm. um, we, we play most of the album um, in, in tribute to, because the, the album was written about uh, an historical event in Australia's early history, which is the Eureka Stockade, which was um, has been sold to down through the times as, oh, well, it was, it was a rebellion by miners against uh, the increase of their fees, which is what triggered it. But it was a, it was the early rumblings of, of uh, republicanism. It was the early rumblings of, well, you know, okay, we're, we're no longer a penal colony. All of a sudden there's this huge influx of immigrants from England. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Europeans started to arrive in 
fucking shiploads, right? So all of a sudden, Australia was becoming a country, like a nation. Right. And um, so the Eureka Stockade was as much about the pushing back, the fight against uh, English uh, colonial tyranny. Okay. Um, that was, uh, was which was a leave over from, uh, you know, the penal colony mentality that established the first European settlement in Australia, which was here in Sydney, but strictly as a penal colony. Oh. You know, boatloads of Irish and Scottish and English prisoners were brought here hmm. and dumped in Australia. And, you know, I mean, predictably, they started to, you know, they started to they build buildings and, you know, had water supply and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, the whole thing just started to grow. And, of course, with mass immigration, they heard back, you know, in, in Britain and... Um, and Europe, this magical place down south, you know, it was a fucking, it was a bit of a trial to get here. <laughs> but if you got here and survived, it was well worth it, you worth know, because it, yeah. it was just, it was a, this amazing country to be, that was found here. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically, um, you know, how we, we, we were popular. Anyway, long story short, that's the story behind Eureka Stockade and, okay. The the, um, the purpose of the tour was to to try and reunite or reignite that that passion of patriotism of, of what it is to be an Aussie, what it is to be Australia, what it is to be not so much nationalistic but patriotic. Someone who loves their country, loves their flag, loves what it stands for, loves your history, good and bad and different, whatever. Yeah, but you know, love who you are as a country, and then you'll be strong. So kind of like and. Um, to reignite the freedom flame? Yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you've been reading my script. No, um, no, I, well, I, I, I like we, your music, so. <laughs> well, we, thank you, uh, mate. Um, we, we incorporated in the last tour we did was the Assault and Battery Tour, which was last year. Because I'm, I'm, now that we, we're in the, the last years of, of the band's life, um, I wanted to re recreate the vibe around each album. And uh, so we did the Assault and Battery Tour, but we included Freedom's Flame, obviously. Um, um, and, and we've included it, of course, in um, uh, this set, uh, for, which we will resume again in, um, in the coming year. But also uh, a song off the Blood Brothers album, 1854, which, of course, is written about Eureka Stockade. Right. Because it happened in 1854. And... Um, yeah, so I just I just thought, you know, it was kind of like our, pardon me, the band's personal contribution to saying to Australians, you know, you shouldn't be apologetic. I mean, okay, every settlement of every country in the world, I mean, you know, Canada experienced it with the Indigenous people or the Aboriginal people, or the, well, not so much Aboriginal people, but the people that were there, you know, before the French and that got there. Right. Um, um, in America, the same with the Europeans, um, uh, South America with the Spanish. There's always a, a host of people that occupy the country when you get there. And um, because Europe was so, uh, through no fault of their own, it was just, a, you know, they had better technology. I mean, they were more advanced. Um, in so many different ways and yes they did destroy wonderful cultures and yes they but that's the nature of all things anyway um loss is always a part of growth okay. you know, and, um, getting back to you know like our personal situation um uh yeah yeah lots and you know i'll say this when i do public speaking um particularly to young people but even to it's not lost on the the older person, but you know, to younger people, I, I, I go out of my way to emphasise that um, because they're led to believe that you know, like yeah, you know, it's, they're not going to suffer too much as long as they do as they're told and obey the rules and blah. But mm. yes, they are. Life doesn't let you get away, and you're not meant to. That's the point. You know, I start my most of my public speaking these days with. 
I say, well, you know, you, you hear the you hear the saying, well, life wasn't meant to be easy. And it's a, you know, it's a fairly sort of glib thing to say because it's profoundly true. Mm-hmm. Life wasn't meant to be easy. Ha, look at my bills. You know, yeah, I got to yeah. pay taxes, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, well, life wasn't meant to be easy. But then you change the emphasis or the intonation and you say, well, life wasn't meant to be easy. You can change it. And that puts a different spin on it because what it says to the person, yes, exactly. You're in control of your own destiny. There's a great wisdom that says you can't change anything, but if you change yourself, you change everything. Yeah. Exactly. Because it's all about perspective. Yeah. It's how you view what is in front of you. And it's important to tell young people that you know, life is not meant to be easy. It's not ever going to be easy because it's not meant to be, because it's meant for you to live, to love, to lose. And that way you learn. Right. Exactly. And it's the only way to learn. I mean, I've been saying that for years. I mean, it's the reason I wrote the, the songs on Scarred for Life because, mm-hmm. um, you know, pain, and I, I've said this for years and years, you know, part of my stage patter, that um, pain is our constant companion. It's, our, it's our, our constant influence in our life. And without it, you know, much of what is to be learned about life, you don't learn without pain. Right. Got one more question, Angry. Actually, it's a two. Yeah. Minutes. Um, is there a song in this country? From... Until, uh, until next time. Well, we're going to do part three for sure. <laughs> Is there a song that you regret rec- not recording and putting on an album? Is there something that you maybe wrote with some of Ooh. your Cooper bandmates that you think, oh, I wish we would have put that on an album? Ah, oh, gee. Um, on another album or at all? At all. Something you might at have jammed with and you recorded, but you thought, you know what? We should have put that on this album. It would have fit or, you know, so-and-so is dearly past us and now i wish i would have recorded that and uh, i'll put on an album with him there's a couple of things um there's a couple of things uh that mick and i had as song ideas uh that we worked on and we every time we did an album we would represent them okay and um, one's, uh, one's called tit for tat, which is uh, an old saying. It's, it's basically about uh, uh, vengeance. It's basically about right. tit, tit for tat is the saying that means, right. well, if you, do, if you do that to me, I'll fucking do that to you. Right. Right. So it's tit for tat. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it came, it, it's come as it's evolved. Um, it's come to me uh, a broader thing in in the modern day appreciation of if it's kind of it's, it's kind of like it's like oh well tit for tat you know it's kind of like well it equals it up yeah you know but but the original meaning was well it's tit for tat you fucked over me over I'm going to fuck you over you know mm-hmm. probably worse but in other words so yeah. it was a it's a real street mentality so i think lyrically it may may be a bit um there's another one too which um is um too drunk to fuck too drunk to fight um something like that it goes yeah too drunk to fight too drunk to fight it was real sort of it goes way back uh, to yep. sort of like the Sex Pistols sort of, it's that kind of tune from what I recall. And I, don't know, I just love, I just love the song. I just thought it was just sort of really cheeky and irre- irre- irreverent and um, it never got picked either. Um, yeah, there's a couple. I, uh, I, I drag it each time we're, when we're writing at the moment uh, with yeah. the new lineup. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for a, for a, um, a new outing, and um, I kind of think 
I, I don't know whether I want to drag them out again. I want to see what, what, what this lineup can come up with and coming up with some fairly cool, like, when I say modern, um, uh, you can you can tell us the tats. You can it's like it's it's roast tattoo music, but mm -hmm. particularly once you know, obviously once the vocals go down on it, but um, it's it's all pretty tough sort of stuff because uh, Ronnie Simmons, the young fella, um, he you know he's an Australian. He lived in Los Angeles for like ten years and. Mm -hmm. Played with uh, you know a great rock and roll band, a band called Faster Pussy Cat. He played with oh, yeah. uh, in the, he played guitar for a couple of years in the Ramones, um, and uh, yeah, played with some some real cool people over in in Los Angeles. But he's come home to well, he, I, I asked him to to come and join the the Rosie Tats, and um, he, he left at the chair because he's, he's, he's what you know he's, he's very, when I say very young he's like he's barely in his thirties but um, a real you know, a real a real pistol he's a fucking great a great player and Mick, uh, Mickey Arnold um, who's playing slide now he um, he was a great mate of um, uh, Pete and um, he used to play with Pete's band um, with Pete's musical partner then Lucy DeSoto. They had a sort of like a the Pete Wells band. Right. And um he's also played in a couple of very uh there's another mate of ours who's like a, an ex skinhead and they had a couple of oi oi rock bands. One was called Standalone and the other one was called Thug and they were quite big on the East Coast here in Australia. Um had a big skinhead uh, following. Mm. Um, so you know he's he's just a just a wonderful wonderful player, and uh, of course you know, Paul DeMarco's back on drums since well he's been out of jail now I suppose close to three years. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you know that was always you know I said to him before he went to jail I said well after he went to jail I said well long as you clean up your act, I mean, I want you to come back and play in the band. And we got Mark Evans playing bass. So mm. we're going to, um, yeah, we, we're hopefully we're going to uh, at least do the demos by the end of the year. Um, because these days the record industry is in such a terrible state. Yeah. Um, yeah. In comparison to what we knew and, you know, like yeah. what we grew up with and, um so we'll have the songs and then we just got to go look for a deal or finance, you know, because mm -hmm. I mean, even though it's a lot cheaper and quicker and easier, you know, with all your pro tools and stuff to actually record an album, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, so, there's the benefit and the positive aspect of being able to record in your own, you know, garage or home studio. Yeah. But then there's the other yeah. aspect, which you're probably going to confirm, that the camaraderie of five or six guys going into the same um, room or building lends a bit more to the probably the the more natural aspect of recording the song. Yes, and um, it's the way we've always done it, <laughs> and we're creatures of a habit. We're too old to change. Mm -hmm. um, well, most of us are. Some of us are. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, it's it, it's the way. Uh, Scotty Crawford, who's now our manager, yeah, he said to, he said to me a while ago. He said, um, uh, "Let's let's look around for the appropriate studio." And we've we've found a couple, and they're rehearsal studios that have got recording. And one of them's uh, a, a friend of um, Demarco's, Paul Demarco, the drummer. It's um out near. It's an industrial straight estate out near where he lives, and it started out as a rehearsal studio. And then the guy, who's a gifted musician himself, he wanted somewhere um, where uh, young bands could come and record. Now we've we've rehearsed there. We're sort of doing demos there, and because um, the, the recording facility is set up and he's, he's building it as he goes so it's improving all the time so what we've got as 
as just um, like rough tracks. Right. I'm listening and, and we, you know, they all sit in the room. But I'm listening to them and going, you know what? With the right mixing and the right mastering, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. That's the sound because the fucking it's and it's the way we've already always recorded. It, it's always the band in the room, even if you only keep the band track, even if you only keep two guitars and a bass, or two guitars and a drum, or a bass and a guitar and a drum. Um, you keep the bulk of what you're recording on the moment and that becomes the guts the right. balls the nuts of the track yeah and, and we're, we're we're lucky enough uh the way that we record that we get most of particularly the rhythm tracks um there's not too many tracks that we've ever committed to vinyl um that we haven't been able to get the whole rhythm track so that's the four instruments mm -hmm together playing at the one time wow only, only maybe only two or three tracks maybe in our whole well you know we we don't have a great history of albums i think we've produced like six in 50 years but, uh, so um you're saying yeah, it'll, be 50, it'll be 50 years in 26 time flies doesn't it yeah well everything comes to an end my friend well, we're not saying anything's coming to an end. You've got a new album coming out. When do you think it will be released? You anticipate? Well, it, it will have to be quite for the business aspect. Um, yeah. If we're to tour Europe next year, which will be summer, it'll have to be out by then. Yeah, so you can um, you can promote it on your tour. So, um, what's the mm -hmm. opposite of unsubscribe? Angry? Sorry. What's the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe. Everybody do as the legend Angry Anderson says and subscribe to the channel. Um, <laughs> yeah, do you, it. Like, you like that one? I love it. Hey, thanks again, my friend, for the nice chat. It's a pleasure always, Ernest. Always. <laughs>